All right, welcome to the show, Richard Weisbord. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm psyched you're here, and I'm really uh, grateful for the work you've done with uh, your study in teens and young adults. That's what we're going to dive into today. But before we do that, Richard, can you give uh, our audience a sense of just a little background on you? Are you married? Do you have kids? And what got you into this study, and why, sh why does, should anyone care about this, and why do you care? Uh, they're all good questions. So I, a, couple, a couple of them are very simple. I got into this uh, because, uh, well, let me, let me start with, with my family. I have three kids. They're 27, 25, and um, 21. I feel very lucky. I have three wonderful kids. Uh, I got into, interested in this partly um, sort of observing their experiences in high school and college. I also got interested in it because I care a lot about ethics and care in relationships and reciprocity in relationships. And in my field, we talk a lot about the parent-child relationship, about friendship, about mentoring. We don't talk very much. I mean, relatively few people are talking about romantic relationships. And I feel like it's probably the most important thing we do or one of the most important things we do. You know, Freud said there are two things that are important in life, work and love. We have whole industries that teach, prepare people for work. We don't really do anything to prepare them for love. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I began, began to feel like this is really important and we're not talking about it. We got to start talking. We got to start talking about it. Yeah, cool. And you uh, give us a little background on you. Uh, you're a professor at Harvard or research. Like, tell us a little bit about you. I'm a senior lecturer at Harvard. I've been at the School of Education at the Kennedy School of Government for 30 years. I've always been, um, I've never been full-time, though. I've always been half-time or two-thirds time. The other part of my time, I started a school. I've written books. I've done a lot of practice work. So that's in a nutshell my life. All right, cool. And also you're married. Is that right? I'm married. Yes. Okay. I've been very happily married. I'm going to have my 30th anniversary um, in wow. a couple of weeks. Nice. That's uh... so. One of the things I'm, you know, one of the things I also got interested in is, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it, is different forms of romantic love at different stages in a relationship. And the kind of love that I have for my wife now is very deep and dazzling in its own way, but it's very different from the kind of love I had when I proposed to her. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Very it changes right after so many years. Uh, and some people think it's supposed to, like, the feel good, you know, first year is supposed to just last forever, right? Yeah. And I think there's this idea that, you know, people know that it's going to fade, but they're like trying to fill up some kind of tank early so they have enough in the tank that they don't run out, <laughs> run out of gas over the many years. Yeah. But that's not really, you know, a constructive way to think about it. I don't, I don't think the kind of love that you have um, early in a relationship, as I said, I don't think it's any... Deeper, in, in many ways, it's much less deep than the kind of love you can have uh, 30 years later and much less gratifying in many ways. Um, but it's different. And uh, I think it's better to think about how love evolves than um, like something that's a high quantity that evaporates over time. Yeah, totally. Let's, uh, let's circle back to that point uh, in a little bit. I want to get into uh, a little bit of this study and how you guys just tell us a, a little bit about what you found and what had you, you said, okay, nobody's talking about this. So I got to, did you decide to just create a study and then you, or people were already kind of talking about this and how did it come together and where did you start to interview young adults and teens? Well, I think I, you know, I think I first started interviewing for this study very informally. Um, you know, just talking, you know, seeing my own kids, talking to my students, um, grads and undergrads, and seeing what their kind of experience was like. One of the things I became very aware of early on is this perception that there was this pervasive hookup culture. But when I was talking to young people, that wasn't really what they were focused on. They were mm -hmm. focused much more on these issues of uh, how do I learn how to love somebody else and be loved by somebody else? And how do I have a mature relationship? Um, so that's one of the places it started. And then we, then we began with my students. We formed a research team about five years ago. We began surveying and interviewing in different parts of the country and asking questions about how people, what do they think love is? Like, how do you know when you fall in love? What is, what is that experience? Um, asking them where they learned about love. I mean, from their parents, from their older siblings, from peers, from television, 
you know, what have, what have the inputs been away? Like how did their notions of love get constructed? Um, what are their worries about romantic relationships? What are their hopes about romantic relationships? So we've been interviewing and surveying for five years or so um, about those questions. And, you know, now we have about over 3,000 survey respondents and lots of formal and informal conversations with young people about mm. these issues. I mean, I feel almost emotional as I hear the questions because it's like, wow, if someone would have invited me into that conversation, you know, when I was 16, 17, 19, 20, like, I mean, just, just the question alone is like, thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, one of the things that I'm struck with, I mean, the other thing, you know, I started to do is I started to include um, thoughts and questions and inquiry about love in my courses and work a couple of workshops I did with high school students. And I started sitting in on a class, an English class, where about a month is devoted to engaging juniors in high school in a conversation about love. So when you're a junior, you're 16, 17, around the age you were just talking about. And these these young people, I mean, it's a wonderful teacher, but these young people were just so engaged and captivated and eager to talk about this. Yeah. And it's exciting. And it's also, you know, it's a wonderful education. It tests, you know, can develop your critical thinking skills, these conversations. It can develop your moral capacities. You know, you're really talking about your obligations to other people and how you express those obligations. What does it mean to care? What does it mean to be generous? Yeah. So, you know, th these can be wonderful conversations with young people. And it's kind of meeting them, as you said, it's meeting them exactly where they are emotionally. Like, that's what they're thinking about a lot is relationships, love and sex. So. Totally. Why is this, why are these questions and wh why is this class, you know, one of the things I, I like to say a lot is, hey, we never got this class in school. And um, the obvious question here is, wh why not? Why is this not being taught? Well, you know, I think in other eras it actually was taught, and it's taught in, in some other countries, not very very many, but in other countries. Um, you know, it's a little bit taught, like marriage classes, and home, under home economics there may have been some conversation about marriage. And, I mean, there was. I mean, and how to develop um, a lasting marriage, I think, I and probably you would have been a lot uncomfortable with um, a lot of the, the ideas that were being promoted in those times because they're very traditional gender roles. Um, yeah. But I think the answer to your question is that schools are absolutely swamped. They're absolutely overwhelmed. They have so many agendas loaded onto them that they do get into this mode of disaster prevention. And, you know, what they really are wanting to avoid is kids getting pregnant, kids getting STDs scandals of different kinds um mm -hmm. you know, the, the better schools are trying to avoid uh, sexual assault um and you know they untrained unsupported low status uh gym teachers or or other teachers are um are are often corralled into teaching a sex ed class without any you know as i said without any training or support yeah so it just gets really sidelined. And um, I'm not imagining that we're suddenly going to have a whole curriculum about love. Although I think that would be a wonderful thing. And there are scattered schools around the country that are doing that. You know, not, there are very few. But I am suggesting you could weave conversation about love into a lot of courses. You could weave it into history. You could weave it into literature. You could weave it into social studies. Um, it could be a topic of sex ed, a really important topic in sex ed that kids would be very engaged in and much less controversial than a lot yeah. of the sex ed topics. So I think we could do a lot more with it in school. Yeah. Do you think, um, and, and it sounds like one of the things you discovered from your study, if I understand it right, was 70 or so percent of kids, young adults and teens were saying, I would want that education. I would want that class. Yeah, I mean, thanks for remembering that. That's right. I mean, um, and that was somewhat, you know, somewhat surprising is the number, as you said, 70%, 72% said they would welcome a conversation with their parents about some emotional aspect of a relationship, a romantic relationship, how to begin a relationship or how to have a mature relationship or how to keep a relationship, how to break up respectfully. And about 65%, so about two thirds said they'd like to have those conversations in school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a significant substantial majority want to have these conversations in home and in school. Yeah, I'm psyched.
And, you know, when we did our interviews, a, a lot of them talked about it. Like they want to talk about, like, how do you find this? How do you identify the signs of a bad relationship? Why, why am I attracted to people who are bad for me? I mean, mm-hmm. these are questions people want to talk about. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's so, like you said, it's what they're talking about with their friends all the time, right? Exactly. You know, how do you keep a breakup from getting ugly? You know, that, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, was there back to the gender piece? I know, um, you know, that, that can be a sensitive area. Was there, did you notice any difference or did you guys track any difference between, um, the responses between boys and girls or men and women? Because I can, you know, back in maybe your generation or mine, we could sort of assume that boys might, someone comes in to teach a class on relationships and they're over there rolling their eyes and giggling and laughing, um, is sort of my fantasy or projection. But is, what did you find when the difference in genders around this conversation? Well, we, um, you know, we were, as you know, we were asking a lot of different types of questions. So, and we get different types of gender differences for different types of questions. One of the things that surprised me some, and I, and I learned this actually in part from my female um, grad students, um, who are wonderful people, and, and the women on my re- the young women on my research team, is um, you know they talked about how cruel and degrading women can be to men, young women can be to men. Uh-huh. How mean? I mean, this didn't shock me, but how mean high school girls can be to each other in the context of romantic and sexual relationships, yeah. and. So, you know, for a lot of reasons, I've been much more focused on the ways in which men can be dominating and degrading and misogyny and harassment. And they were not um, re- they were not disagreeing with any of that, but they were saying there's another problem, too. It may not be as big, but, you know, there are women who are also degrading and manipulative in relationships. And we got to talk about that as well. Yeah. So that was, you know, somewhat eye opening for me. I mean, you know, um, I think in general, uh, women, you know, we have a lot of men who are looking for a woman, um, you know, because we were sampling all over the country, some very traditional parts of the country. They're looking for women who, uh, want to take care of them. Basically. I don't, I don't mean financially take care of them, but want to be the nurturers and, and raise children. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we see trad- traditional gender roles in some communities and, you know, and, and we see women who want men to be the strong provider. I mean, those kind of, notions um and that's their notion of what a a man should be in a romantic relationship and um those kind of notions are still very alive and well in many parts of the country and many communities yeah yeah absolutely what else um what else did you guys find that would be helpful for our listener to know about so we've got basically that the hookup culture maybe you could talk about that just that the projection onto teens and young adults is that uh, it's very promiscuous and it's, um, kind of intense and it's unsafe all the time. And, uh, it seems like what you, you guys found was that that's not entirely true. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are things about the hookup culture that I do find concerning. I mean, it is, as you know, associated with, um, a lot of alcohol use and often, you know, alcohol abuse and substance abuse. Uh, you know, there is, there does appear to be a somewhat higher likelihood of sexual assault, um, among people who are, you know, for reasons that are not that mysterious among people who are hooking up frequently. Um, but, uh, it's much, you know, there are a lot of hookups that end well, and there are, uh, there just aren't very many, there are just many fewer people involved in the hookup culture than anybody thinks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we ask people to estimate how many people are hooking up frequently, they guess 60 or 70 percent. But the real percent is you know, more like five to 10 percent. You know, it's wow. not it's just not happening, you know, very frequently. Um, people are just way off about this. I mean, you know, maybe roughly 10 to 15 percent of young people are involved in some kind of hookup culture. But that but, you know, that, that when we focus on them, we miss the 85 to 90 percent who are not involved in that culture and are really you know, often um, struggling with other things, including how to have a, a, a meaningful romantic relationship. So, and I think it can also pressure people. It can make people feel like there's something wrong with them if they're not hooking up, these misperceptions. Yeah. And it can pressure people to have, you know, to hook up when they're not interested or ready. So, um, you know, so those are, so those are concerns. Mm-hmm. In terms of your other question about, you know, sort of what I want people to know from the study, um, 
I don't know who your primary audience is for, for this, but you know, we young people, I think there's sort of some missignaling that goes on. I think that older adults often think that young people don't want to talk about romantic relationships and, um, and sexuality. And often that's true, but, um, often young people do want to talk about those things under the right circumstances in the right way yeah. with the right, yeah. with the right adults. And I think sometimes, you know, we talk to high school and, uh, college age students, 18 to 25 year old young people who thought their parents didn't want to talk about it. Um, right. So, you know, you got this, this kind of disconnect where parents think that their kids don't want to talk about it. And kids think the parents don't want to talk about it or teachers think their students and vice versa. Everybody doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So that gets talked about. So we're trying to kind of open that up here. You know, we're trying yeah. to say, uh, it's important to talk about it. I mean, the other message for parents and teachers is that students' kids are bombarded with images about love all the time, right? Like on TV or in the movies or yeah. a scan, you know, a high profile scandal in Hollywood um, involving a couple, uh, you know, a, a, an explosive divorce, whatever. And they're often, you know, TV's films, songs, really destructive. <laughs> Um, unhealthy images of love. And as a teacher and parent, it just seems really irresponsible to me to not challenge those. Like when you're listening to a song lyric or watching a television show or listening to, um, to the, you know, to the radio together, I mean, uh, or reading a book, you know, you both read a book that has content about a, a romantic image that's troubling. So we're partly saying there's these constant opportunities to talk about it and it can be irresponsible not to engage young people in those circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, it almost, I almost heard like a, a, uh, avoidance in there of nobody wants to talk about it. I just wanted to quickly ask you why, why is that? Like, why is it that we keep deferring talking about this to someone else? Is that religion? Is that conditioning? What is that? I think part of it is that there are a lot of parents who feel like they failed in their own relationships. So they feel like, you know, we have almost half of parents divorcing. We have a lot of marriages that are unhappy marriages. So I think, you know, parents, many parents think they don't have wisdom to share, but you know, relationship failures can generate as much wisdom as relationship successes. You can still have a lot of wisdom if you fail, if you fail in a relationship. So I think, you know, I think that's one of the things going on. I think there's also this idea that kids don't want to think about or talk about their parents' relationship. They just kind of want to assume it. But often kids have lots of questions, right, about their parents' relationships. And when they get older, you know, particularly when they get past high school, um, they're very able to have mature conversations mm -hmm. about it. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the things going on as well. Um, I think sometimes young people don't want to ask parents because they're worried it's going to be awkward for their parents or it's going to embarrass their parents because their parents have had a relationship failure. Um, you know, so there are a bunch of different things going on. Yeah. And, and we know probably plenty of people who are maybe still married, but not, it's clearly young people can, can sense and feel that they're not happily married and there's just sort of coexisting. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, I wouldn't want to necessarily seek a lesson from that couple yeah although they might as i said they might have wisdom but I, but that's right i think you probably wouldn't want to seek a lesson or you would feel like they wouldn't want to talk about it because yeah. they're not happy yeah. um that it would be really awkward you know sort of opening up a pandora's box to, yeah. to answer that conversation um but you know in this in the scenario in the situation you're describing in many ways right it's even more important to talk about yeah you know? agreed Okay. Um, as we wind down, Richard, uh, what, what, uh, what's the message then to parents? What, what's, what do you want to say to parents? If, if there were a bunch of parents listening right now, what, what do you want to well, communicate? Well, what is that, you know, when you are with your child, um, uh, watching TV, going, you know, going to the movies, reading, listening to song lyrics, it's really important to challenge misconceptions about romantic love. Um, because those, you know, can shape how your child comes to understand romantic love. I think it's also um, that this is something that you should kind of pilot. Like, there, there are going to be stages in your kid's life where they're going to really want to talk to you. And so if you can convey periodically your openness to the talk about love, to that conversation, um, you might find it's very rewarding for them and it's very rewarding for you. 
Yeah, that's great. And and why not? It's an opportunity to connect and, and have a deeper connection with your, your child, right? Exactly. Yes. Well put. It's, um, it's a way of, of having a, a very gratifying and deepening conversation with your child. Yeah, cool. Well, Richard, uh, how can I help, man? Uh, you know, we're doing the relationship school over here and we're fired up to reach young people um, slowly but surely. I'm curious if there's a way, I'm, I'm just grateful for your research and I'm curious if there's a way either the listener or me personally, how can we help, um, you know, get the word out or help you? And I'm so curious also what the next step is here for you. Yeah. So, um, I really appreciate the question. I really appreciate what you're doing here. I think it's terrific. Um, you know, if people, uh, are want to look at the report, we have lots of resources in the report. We have guidance and tips for parents, for educators. We have um, but we also have, you know, there are other programs out there, curriculum programs, resources, I think can be very valuable. And we have a quite long list of those resources for people to access. Um, I think people should, should continue to watch your, listen to your podcast, watch your show. <laughs> they should do, and they should get involved in the relationship school. And, um, yeah, and I think that uh, that's really mostly what I want to convey, that this kind of thing doesn't happen magically. You know, you don't learn um, magically how to have a, a wonderful relationship with someone else. you got to talk to people and talk to people with experience and wisdom. That's right. Awesome. What's, uh, what's the next step for you and, um, and the study and, and where are you guys going now? Well, the this, this study, we are pretty much winding, we have pretty much wound up for, for now. Um, I, what we're going to be focusing on over the next couple, you know, year or two is developing what we hope are, are better resources, continuing to develop better resources for parents, educators, young people themselves, um, serving as a kind of clearinghouse for other folks who are developing those kind of resources. Uh, yeah, so I think that's where we're at. We're, right. we're, yeah. Very cool. And where can people find you if they want to contact you? Or um, I'll certainly include your, you know, uh, links in the show notes and this, as well as a link to the study. Yeah, they can contact me at Richard underscore Weisbord at Harvard. I mean, it, just Richard Weisbord. If you Google me at Harvard, my email address will pop up and, and people can contact me. Okay. And is there, a, is there also a website of make, Making Caring Common? Yeah. MakingCaringCommon.org. It's just MakingCaringCommon.org. Okay, so, awesome. And, and it looked to me like the, the brief scan I took of Mary, Making Car Caring Common uh, was that you guys are addressing a lot of um, social issues, um, you know, from sexual are. assault to misogyny and just, you know, aggression maybe in the classroom or with Yeah, kids, I mean, so. it's, it's a lot about how you develop care and uh, sense of justice in kids, um, how do you prevent bullying, uh, gender bias. So yes, we deal with a lot of different kinds of issues. Okay, cool. Well, Richard, thanks again for your time, man. It's been awesome hanging out with you. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Take care. All right. See ya. <laughs>